excited to welcome you all to our webinar with our presenters, Carolina Gabaldon and Erin Robinson. Now, before I bring up our presenters for today, I will go over a few logistical items. Um, Nancy has already uh, clarified some of these in the chat, but just so we're on the same page, I do wanna let you know that this webinar is being recorded. So um, it is going to be accessible to all of you um, at the end of the day through a follow-up email as long as, as, as well as the slides. So this will all be shared with you. Um, and if you've experienced any technical difficulties throughout the webinar, please feel free to reach out to Nancy Burden or uh, Brittany Hunsinger via the chat box and they'll be happy to assist you. So after the presentation, um, we will devote about 10 to 15 minutes, depending on time, um, at the end of the, today's webinar for questions, um, and answer. So if any questions arise uh, throughout the webinar, please feel free to choose our Q&A feature and submit your questions there. Then we'll be answering them um, at the Q&A portion of our webinar. Okay, so in today's webinar, um, Breaking the Cycle of ACES, our presenters will explore how public health providers can partner with communities to build resilience and break the cycle of inter intergenerational trauma. Next slide, please. Okay, so the Institute for Public Strategies, also known as IPS, is a public health organization that specializes in implementing population level prevention programs that reduce health disparities in, excuse me, disparities and advance equity. We do this by working alongside residents and other stakeholders to advocate for policy and systems change to improve health, safety, and quality of life at a population level. Our subject matter experts have provided nationwide technical assistance and training across a range uh, of functions for, fund, for funders, government agencies, um, prevention services, organizations, and community groups. So now it is my pleasure to introduce our speakers um, for today, Kalina Kalbandon and Erin Robinson. The floor is yours. Good morning, good morning. Thank you so much. Thank everyone for being here. So, Today, we're gonna to talk about ACES. We're gonna talk about the connection with ACES and also capacity building, right? So what are we here to learn? What are we here to talk about? We're here to first understand, we're here to provide and we're here to learn. We're here to understand the data collection and policies analysis strategies to assess, to assess the root cause of community trauma and toxic stress. Then we're also here to provide real world examples of communities that have successful policies to advance equity and lower the, uh, the incidences of ACEs. And finally, we're here to learn, learn how to build a coalition of advocates equipped to make the community more resilient. All right, uh, next slide, please. So the first thing we wanna address is what do we already know about ACEs? As public health professionals, there's a lot that we should already know about ACEs. So um, before we dive in, uh, let's take a look at what we should already understand about adverse childhood experiences. Next slide, please. So we should already have a working knowledge of the original ACEs study conducted from 1995 to 1997 by the CDC and Kaiser Permanente. And the goal of today's webinar is to expand on what we already know and shift the focus from the negative consequences to the positive outcomes. Next slide, please. So we are already aware of the negative health risk associated with ACEs and toxic stress. So it's not uncommon to, as a person growing up to experience at least one event of ACEs. However, there is a strong correlation with over 40 common health conditions and the cause of nine to 10 leading causes of death in the US and just some to include cancer and heart disease, right? And also associated with that, we want to include mental health, we want to include violence or also being a victim of violence. So if a person experiences two or more, you're gonna increase the risk of a chronic disease. Three or more, you're gonna increase the risk of heart disease and lung cancer. And we're gonna discuss key topics to consider when addressing the ACEs. Now, unfortunately, it's not reversible. Once you experience it, it's not a, it is irreversible. And the negative impacts can be great. But our primary goal here is we should be 
focusing on helping children, families, or other individuals build resiliency. So next slide, please. So also we wanna understand that now that ACES has expanded from its original uh, categories, we want to know. We want you to know that it doesn't matter which of the four that a person has experienced. All all events are harmful, and they're all the same. The, the brain cannot distinguish one type of toxic stress from another. Right? It's all toxic stress, and it has all the same impact on a person. And so we're going to look at certain behavior models that we that we're going to use because we want to change the, the behavior. So if you at least change one factor, one or more factors, then you can encourage change. Next slide. So we see out of this expanded version of ACEs, we see that once um, I want you to look at, let's say adult responsibilities. This is not your typical young teenager learning how to be responsible with money. We're talking about a young teenager who does have to get a job to help the, the family make ends meet and contribute to the family. And if their contribution does not, not incur, that, that actual events can impact the household, right? So that's an increased amount of stress, toxic stress, if you will, because their financial contribution is not just solely based on them as the individual, it, it impacts the family as a whole. We also, I want you to look at, let's say, um, being a caregiver. This is not your typical or traditional, excuse me, traditional experience of having chores as a child, right? Making sure your room stays clean, helping clean the dishes in the kitchen. We're talking about extending beyond that. We're talking about um, cooking, cleaning, or ensuring that you, you or your siblings complete their schoolwork because one or more of your parents stay continuously out of the household, right? We're talking about your siblings or your parents see you as a, as a pillar of the, of the household at your young age, relying on you, overextending you and your capabilities. Also, I want you to let's look at adjustment. One or more life changes can be significant, whether it's divorce, whether it's um, even because of the result of the, the, of the divorce, losing social economic status, um, bereavement, or just totally being removed from the household altogether because of uh, being placed in foster care because of any neglect or abuse you've experienced as a child. Right? And finally, let's look at cultural and community trauma, the pandemic. Now, as adults, the pandemic is stressful for us. Now let's make that relevant to a young child, a young elementary child, a young school, school age child having to do with the pandemic. Now let's also introduce events like social, uh, mass school shootings, social protests, and just the community violence that they may encounter where they live. As adults, that is very stressful for us to endure. Now let's keep in, in, in perspective of how does a child process that? How does a child in, endure that toxic stress? Next slide, please. Carolina, yeah. you're muted. Of course I am. <laughs> well, now that we understand there's multiple factors that induce stress in childhood, Let's define, um, let's define toxic stress. Um, toxic stress is what we consider to be the excessive stress response from the body that um, it activates when we perceive something to be danger or a threat. And what we know about stress is that when it becomes chronic, it results in wear and tear in our bodies and increases our risk for the negative health consequences that Aaron just talked about. So some of the root causes of stress that you see at the bottom of the slide here um, are also contributing factors. So in looking at community trauma um, today, some of the things that introduce community trauma are neighborhood violence, um, racism, and disparities in housing, health, education, and income. But one of the main points I'd like to make here is that 
Um, we see in the upper right hand corner of this slide, the addition of the environmental component. So we're not just looking at things um, from the household that are occurring that produce stress or even just our immediate community, but we're also looking at things that are out side of our control that can produce stress like the COVID pandemic. So one way that um, this has impacted us all, particularly children, is infectious diseases that you see, delist that you see listed here. So with um, COVID-19, our normal lives were significantly disrupted, bringing about many changes and influencing our overall mental health. So what I wanna focus on here is that we as adults had a lot of trouble dealing with this and um, this really did trickle down to our children. So not only did they experience their stress, but they also experienced our stress. Next slide, please. Okay, so now we, we've defined it. We've also looked at the expanded root causes of ACEs and the expanded how ACEs has grown. So we're going to address the problem. And, Meaning, uh, how do we gain insight to this, this serious impact? And if you go to the next slide, one of the main key components is data collection, primary and secondary data collection. So we want to research. We want to understand that one, our, our help is needed and that there is a need. So when we collect primary and secondary data, whether it's social assessment or epidemiological assessment, we can begin to break down the questions and see where the immediate need is. And then we can develop a plan to one as providers uh, begin to address these issues and then also develop a plan to gain support, to gain, um, to, to gain ed educational and ecological assessments, right? So once we get the primary secondary data done, we can begin the behavioral and environmental assessments. Next slide, please. So first thing we're gonna begin with with data is uh, quantitative data. So this is all about numbers, right? We wanna first determine what is the scope of our problem in our, in our specific community, um, in our county or in our, in our state. And one of the ways that we've been able to um, collect this information is through the use of screening tools. So the one that I'd like to highlight today is provided by uh, ACES Aware. And um, this specific screening tool uh, expands on the original 10 ACEs. It has seven, diff um, seven additional categories that they've added beyond the original 10 um, for ages zero to 11. And then for the age group of adolescents, 12 to 19, there's an additional nine factors. So there's uh, three uh, different um, screening tools that are available. One is for the child. So we have zero to 11. Then we have um, adolescent that is reported by a parent or a caregiver. And then we also have adolescents who can self-report their experiences um, and record an ACE score. So these tools are available courtesy of acesaware.org. And if you, um, once you receive the presentation, you can click on that link in um, screening tools and it will take you directly to that website where you can access those tools. Um, they're very effective. They're being used not only by clinicians, pediatricians, schools, but by community-based organizations to collect that quantitative data that we need to determine um, the scope of the problem in our community. Next slide, please. So speaking of uh, qualitative data, here's another tool that you can use. This is your ACES questionnaire that you can find if you follow this link right here on ACES Aware. And what it is, is it's going to measure the indicators to allow where are the areas that we can prevent toxic stress, right? And these are asking a person prior to the age of 18, how many of these events that have occurred that you have experienced? It doesn't even ask you to identify which ones, it just wants to know how many of them. And after that, you, you make a total of it. And it also further asks, now that you have identified how many of these events that you have experienced prior to your 18th birthday, do you believe any of these events have a direct impact on your health, right? 
And so we're, we're doing the primary and the secondary data collection, and now we're starting to get into wanting to do the behavior and the environmental assessment, because what we want to do, we want to address the behavior and the lifestyle and the environment. And then again, to change a person's behavior, you, you should at least change one or more of the factors that contribute to, to, the, uh, the, to the behavior that you want to change. Next slide, please. So some of these areas, if you looked at the question, if when you look at the questionnaire, it's gonna ask like, did you feel that you didn't have enough to eat? When you went to school, were, you cl were your clothes dirty? Or um, did you lose a parent through death or divorce or flat out abandonment? Um, do you live with a person who drinks or in, in uses drugs? Um, have you lived with anyone that has went to jail? These, these do impact a person's uh, environment, right? And it does impact a person individually. So now when you look at events like food insecurities or climate change, access to care, that's another huge one that we overlooked as far as ACEs. There are many children that do not get to go to the dentist regularly because of uh, factors that they do not control or they did not get their vaccinations or go to the hospital as regularly as they should because it was outside of their control, right? Also, substance use, we talked about that. Next, the, the intimate partner violence and the dis, uh, discrimination and racism that Ms. Carolina addressed earlier. Any, uh, next slide, please. So our first example that we have here um, is looking at food insecurity data. And what I really wanna highlight in this particular slide is that there's covariates, right? So we not only experience one ACE, but we also experience another. So in this example, you can see here that children living in food insecure homes have the highest increase for risk of domestic violence. And this is followed by neighborhood violence. So these things are important because, uh, particularly in food insecure homes, because we're not always just dealing with one individual family. We're often looking at entire neighborhoods where people um, are food insecure. And then when you're looking at the crime aspect of it, neighborhood crime and violence are also associated with food insecurity, thereby increasing our ACEs risk. Next slide, please. This um, slide here uh, gives us a subgroup population of interest of um, sexual orientation. So the data that we see here is that um, in LGBTQ plus communities, um, ACEs are significantly higher. So we're looking at a percentage rate here um, for ACEs in LGB communities uh, being 41.6 that report more than um, four ACEs. So in this particular um, group of five to eight ACEs, we have 28.8% that actually have experienced ACEs in this population. So not only can we collect um, like uh, widespread data, but we can also narrow our data collection to specific groups of interest. Next slide, please. So here we're, we're going to discuss the intimate partner violence as a whole. And as we see that ACEs has expanded, so has intimate partner violence, right? And this is something that the data shows that uh, there is a higher risk of substance abuse when a person experiences ACEs, uh, in intimate partner violence in the home. Domestic violence is already a risk factor. So now you're going to introduce uh, an additional risk, which is substance abuse. And that's going to compound the factors of toxic stress. And it's an alarmingly high uh, correlation to increase the likelihood that a person will be a victim of intimate partner violence or sexual violence in their adulthood. And, and studies do show that, that, let's say, women that experience three uh, violent ACEs in their lifetime are three, three and a half times more likely to become a victim of intimate partner violence. And a man is three or more times likely to be uh, violent or the perpetrator of intimate uh, partner violence. And in California itself, an individual with four or more ACEs is 11.6 times more likely to report being forced to have sex uh, after the age of 18. And when we're talking about intimate partner violence, that's, we're not even talking about the stalking 
We're not talking about using religion as a form of intimate partner violence. We're not talking about using uh, legal uh, intimidation as a form of, form of intimate partner violence, where we're talking about that type of control that one partner may have over another who does or does not have a record. We're not talking about the economic control that a person has that is seen as intimate partner violence, restricting a person's ability of financial independence or access to family, the, the household income. A person may also isolate uh, someone from their family or their support system. That is a, a form of intimate partner violence, right? Or even use their children. You can't see the kids if you leave me. If you do this, I may hurt the kids. Or in order to protect the kids from being hurt, that person then allows themselves to be the, the, the focus of the, of the, of the attack. Um, please go to the next slide. So making it all connect, right? So we're, we, we are, we're looking at the increased risk of substance abuse, the socioeconomic disparities and the geographical disparities. I want to uh, first look at the geographical disparities. So this is a, a cross-sectional study from 2008 to 2013 of the California Behavior Risk Factor Sur Surveillance Study. And it highlights here how Los Angeles County has 60% uh, of residents that experience one or more ACEs. San Diego, 59% one or more ACEs. San Bernardino County, 62% or of uh, one or more ACEs, right? These are the areas that I picked because here at IPS, we, we service these areas. But let's look at the counties with the highest numbers of, of ACEs. That's Butte County. Butte County has 76.5% of residents who have experienced one or more form of ACEs. And Humboldt County and um, then Mendocino County combined together has 75% of residents that have experienced one or more ACEs. And when we're talking about uh, geographical disparities, let's look at, according to this study, let's look at the lowest number of experienced ACEs as was found in Santa uh, Santa Clara County at 53% and San Mateo County at 53% with residents who have experienced one or more events of ACEs. So that when you, when you have that disparity, it connects to the social economic disparities where we're looking at unemployment, high school dropout or not continuing to go further on their education and living below the federal poverty level. And then we're gonna look at the risk factors because of their disparities, they're more likely to smoke, they're more likely to abuse uh, uh, substances and, and other alcohol, uh, alcohol uh, items. Next slide, please. So our next example for data um, is uh, qualitative data. So one of the best ways that we can collect qualitative data and information on ACES is through information provided by our community residents. So you'll note at the bottom of the slide on the left, we have listen because that is the most important key factor in, um, in building resiliency in our communities to be able to listen to their needs. So following this link, this link will take you to a resource guide that um, can help facilitate the development of focus groups that can collect um, information to build resiliency in our communities. So one important thing about um, focus groups is that it not only gives them an opportunity to share their needs, but it also helps us to reduce toxic stress in their neighborhoods by identifying those key things that they tell us to determine what not only their needs are, but the needs of the community. Next slide, please. So now we've collected information on ACEs to determine the scope of our problem. So what's next? Uh, the answer is community organizing. And community organizing, this is all about connecting with like-minded people across um, many, diff many different disciplines to achieve a common goal, which is to build resiliency and reduce ACEs. So our shared vision um, should be the core focus. Next slide, please. 
So speaking of shared vision, so we, we're, we've done the data collection, the primary and secondary, and we're addressing the behavior and, inter, and environmental uh, factors. Now we're, we're getting to the education, right? And as a planning team, um, there is a social uh, assessment of uh, primary data collection where you look at, let's say the pre pre proceed model where you complete a checklist and you're going to assess with the primary and secondary data efforts that are already happening in your in your county and which efforts that you should remain to enhance. Where, where are the gaps? Where are the weak holes, right? And after you complete this checklist, the prevention survey checklist that you can click on the link here, it will, you can use that to answer and guide your discussion groups about what changes that you wanna have to strengthen your community and, and your prevention system, right? The prevention network, that references a prevention planning team, which includes the group of the public and the private organizations that can be you, the TA, that is formed to focus on family strengthening and to start the prevention plan, planning. So here again, we're, we are with the education and the behavior change. One of the main tools that I see that has done a really good job here in California is OCAP, the Office of Child Abuse Prevention and uh, California Department of Social Services. They administer the grants, contracts, and state programs with a design to promote the best practices and innovate pro uh, approaches to child abuse prevention, intervention, and treatment. And, and it serves a statewide source of information, uh, developing and disseminating in, uh, educational material regarding prevention and early in intervention programs. Uh, it also gives you activities you can do and researches. Um, because what we want to do is we want to not just think of it as singularly, as we want to see it as everyone's problem. And we want to not have the default setting as it's, it's only the parent's problem or it's only the child's problem. We want to, with coalitions, attack the uh, other areas, right? Um, some other grants that can be used uh, through OCAP is the community-based child abuse prevention, promoting safe and stable families. And that's where you can find a lot of resources for families, let's say, whether it's child care, whether it's um, counseling services for parents that are dealing with toxic stress themselves because of economic or, or stresses that they experience as a child. And we're trying to break those intergenerational curses. And, and these tools that we're using to identify the efforts, we, we always got to retool them to see if they need to be improved. And we can always use discussion to, to impact that change and strengthen the, the resiliency that we're trying to build. Next slide. So this brings us to building capacity. Now that we've identified organizations and services that have a shared vision, to build resiliency through community organizing, we can work together to build capacity in the community to reduce toxic stress and improve child, family, and individual well being. Um, we have some examples here that can exemplify what capacity building looks like in a community. Our first example that you see here, uh, once again, is tied to food insecurity. Um, and the name of this particular program that I'm going to highlight today is Clumax Trauma Informed Hunger Relief Project. This project uh, investigated problems related to food insecurity that go way back to childhood traumas and the harmful impacts that they collectively have on the community um, with a, a focus to end hunger um, that really doesn't um, have anything to do with food. We're looking way back at those childhood traumas. And their specific vision is in building self-healing communities and that is their call to action. Another example that we have through uh, building capacity with coalitions is um, that's dedicated to reducing ACEs is the ACEs Research Resilience Resource Commons for Community Action Network. So their acronym, their acronym is ARRRCC. Um, long, <laughs> long, but I got it out there. 
So what they do is they focus on developing and implementing community-wide strategies for addressing childhood trauma um, with a focus on improving early childhood development. Um, their specific coalition building strategies help coalitions work to reduce things that cause trauma like homelessness, evictions, child abuse, domestic violence, substance abuse, or even unmet mental health needs. Next slide, please. Or actually, Aaron, you're up. <laughs> Almost so skipped good. over you there. Sorry about that. It's awesome. It's okay. Easy. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> so we're talking about coalitions that Ms. Carolina discussed that was connected to intimate, uh, intimate partner violence. There's also uh, the positive and adverse childhood experience connection. This is a, this is what the CDC and Kaiser did the, to connect it, right? Um, and they, they mainly wanted to focus on five areas. They wanted to study and then they wanted to, they, they wanted to study to show that most people in the U.S. have experienced at least one form of ACEs, but they also wanted to compare to those who have experienced three or more. And and you know that's that's talking about the intimate partner violence, witnessing violence outside the home, or experiencing bully or or physical abuse, or losing their parents through divorce, or they also wanted to to connect that to how that impacts a child's brain, the neurobiological uh, toxic stress, because again, remember it's it's all bad and and it impacts us all. And it, they want to study how the toxic stress caused by ACEs damages the function and structure of a child's development. Then they connect that to the health consequences, as we talked about, you know, the chronic illnesses and things like um, diabetes, heart disease, lung cancer. It, it shows the connection between that, the correlation of that, and the historical and generational trauma because not only are we trying to break generational curses, we're trying to trace back those roots like that tree we saw earlier in the slide. We're trying to trace those roots back to see where we can attack those areas where we can do prevention, early intervention for ACEs. PACES, PACES does a great job at that. Um, they also have other interest areas. These are just some that I found. Um, it, they connect PACES and African-Americans uh, Latinx communities, um, nourishment, paces and nourishment, as we discussed, the food insecurities. They do social sciences. They do um, early childhood and education because, again, going back to we want to encourage one high school graduation. We want to encourage college or further continued education. Uh, paces does study that, and, and that is another area of interest that they have. Next slide, please. So now we're looking at this Venn diagram and we're seeing how the, um, the, the ability, if you, if you think about the ecological theory and model, it, it's going, what we do when we offer TA, whether it's us or other providers, when we offer TA, what we're trying to do is we're trying to connect the individual, the macro and the, and the meso system, we're trying to connect that, or the, excuse me, the micro system, we're trying to connect that with the macro and exosystem. We're trying to connect the individual and their family, their immediate uh, environment, and we're trying to connect the community or the, the environments that are, are indirectly in, impacting them. We're trying to bridge those together, right? And one of the ways we do that was through awareness. We want to reduce the toxic stress. We want to support positive parenting. And relationship norms. That is another thing that when we're talking about providing a, a TA and resources, we want to look at now we've identified what these toxic stress uh, factors are and these problems are. We want to equip individuals with the ability to create healthy relationships, create healthy boundaries, and to break those generational curses that we were talking about, right? And then when they do that, they build resiliency. They they build resiliency, the the, the family builds resiliency and the community builds resiliency and begins to thrive. That is what our goal should be when we are attacking ACEs, tox and toxic stress. Next slide, please. 
One of the things that we a lot about is um, is impact, and so I just want to take a look to discuss framing our conversation around ACEs, um, reframing the conversation to focus on the potential of people to heal rather than the impending doom of inevitable negative consequences that are irreversible um, can make great strides in building community resilience. So if you constantly hear people talking about the impacts um, as public health providers and professionals, it's our uh, responsibility to turn this conversation around and focus on perspectives that bring hope and encouragement um, in order for that uh, resiliency to begin to build. So key things here for that is to focus on, um, we want to balance adversity with resilience. By focusing on potential, we shift the posit or we shift the focus from positive to negative. And while we can't necessarily erase their past, we can increase their opportunities by building resilience. Another thing that we can take a look at is um, avoiding bad parent philosophy. So a lot of times we hear about um, difficult childhoods and circumstances that bring about stress and, and ACEs for children as they're growing up. And um, we don't wanna focus on pointing the blame or directing it even indirectly to the parents because um, often children face these things. Uh, we know they face them out of their control and often parents are the same. They're experiencing things out of their control that also produce toxic stress. And what we're looking at here is intergenerational trauma, which what impacts um, grandparents to parents um, also affects the children. And so um, by avoiding that bad parent philosophy, we can um, focus on reducing stress, re reducing those um, situations that cause stress and focus on uh, the positive aspect of it. Um, uh, one key factor for this thing is to um, consider that there's really nothing positive about pointing blame. And then uh, another way that we can also reframe the conversation is we, you want to share proven or promising policies that demonstrate effectiveness and provide support. Uh, one one pr um, good example that I can really think of is not necessarily one that is a community one, but what these policies should do is provide relief to individuals and families. And um, the example that I'm going to give here is uh, it is a governmental policy, but um, is the financial stimulus package. So we know that all during COVID, um, many people were experiencing some of these things such as food insecurity, um, limited housing opportunities, and many of those things that produced a lot of stress during that time. And so some of the, um, the federal policy for stimulus really made a change in providing some of that much needed support. And then we also have um, in states, we had rent relief um, and assistance programs that were developed to uh, help people maintain their housing so they weren't being evicted and being forced out on the street. So we really want to look at all those different levels of policies that provide relief and support. And um, while the stimulus package um, is was a federal program, the concept overall is the same. Our, um, we really want to just over um, reduce excessive stress and um, build resiliency. Finally, what we want to focus on is solutions. Um, we always want to be able to provide uh, the opportunity that solutions exist. Um, always focusing on the negative impact doesn't really provide any hope. And it's our job to let people know that there's ways to overcome ACEs and that we don't have to accept that just because they've had adverse experiences that their fate is sealed and negative consequences. Um, we want to aim to raise awareness um, 
And sometimes in raising awareness, we tend to get lost in that impact that ACEs can have that doesn't focus enough on the possibility of positive recovery and healing. And so this really goes back to our concept of balancing adversity with resiliency. Um, reframing the conversation is one of the most important key factors in upstream prevention. Um, this brings a ray of hope to the table um, and many things can happen as a result. We can relieve pressure and help to head off childhood adversity before it happens. And even more importantly, for those who've already experienced ACEs, we can let them know that solutions exist. Next slide, please. So when we're talking about policy, we are, we're, we're, we we're wanting to shift and, and move that needle. And like Ms. Carolina mentioned that re reframing is, is very essential. Reframing, listening is very, are very essential to, to affecting change and building resiliency. And, 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 and it can be hard. It can be difficult finding equity in policies related to uh, ACEs. That's very challenging. But if you click on, um, if, if you look at some of these, what first five ACEs aware and California home visiting programs, what they, what they did was using the prevention checklist, they looked at how to be proactive and support bringing organizations together because many times we as organizations and um, providers, we kind of live in silos when we want to provide assistance, technical assistance, but sometimes you, it's good to use other programs and, and collaborate with other programs to, to build that resiliency within the individual and in their community. And, and through the building um, healthy communities by increasing the awareness and the support and supporting positive uh, relationships and healthy relationships, you know, these these three really do a great job at doing doing that and addressing that because when we're looking at administration and policy assessment and policy change and the and using something like the prevention checklist, we want to look at the, the providers like health services and education and promotion. We want to do that because those address any of the predisposing factors. They also, they also reinforce factors and they and they and they then they do the enabling, the the, the building capacity and, and resiliency, and which goes back to behavior change and lifestyle change and environmental change. And, and remember, we want to change at least one or more of the factors to get back to that behavior change and that, that environment and lifestyle change so that it can increase quality of health and quality of life. Uh, next slide, please. So this brings us to how can we move the needle on equity. Um, one example of how we can move the needle on equity uh, while also reducing ACE factors is through um, the Prevention Institute's a health equity and multi-sector approach to preventing domestic violence. Um, this particular uh, report was an overarching report um, approach to advancing health equity with a multi-sector approach to domestic violence prevention um, by promoting safe relationship policies. And this project um, helped to identify many different elements and um, immediate steps that were needed to be able to move this approach forward. The Prevention Institute um, has a lot of um, good resources that promote policy. Uh, one of their particular projects is uh, San Francisco a resilience project called Bridge Housing that has advanced the notion of trauma-informed community building and um, has improved outcomes for people living in public housing with their strategies that address and prevent community trauma. So these types of approaches, they aim to foster social connectedness and trust in public housing with this specific program, while other resources provided by the Prevention Institute can also tackle other areas that are ACEs related. Next slide. This brings us to our organization, the Institute for Public Strategies. How has IPS worked to reduce toxic stress and build resiliency in our communities? The first um, project that I'd like to highlight is uh, food insecurity. Um, I know I'm talking a lot about it, but we've experienced a lot of it over the last two years with COVID. Um, so this particular project um, in reducing ACEs and toxic stress 
We know that um, food insecurity is associated with toxic stress and um, has adverse long-term physical and mental health outcomes. And recognizing that food insecurity is a form of trauma, it allows for trauma-informed principles to be used in policy development that address food insecurity. So this brings us to the concept of urban farming. And urban farming has been used um, to strengthen the resiliency of food systems and improve short and long-term food security overall. So um, how our project was involved in this is um, in Pomona, California, we, had, um, we were involved in the Lopez Urban Farm um, project, which was a community-based collaborative between local community groups, um, businesses, universities, and school districts. And this project involved the development of working on um, of working urban farm um, urban farms that were using a two and a half acre lot that provided many different things like access to clean food and how to access clean and safe green spaces. And they also aim to address trauma through healing circles, yoga, and art. And so this um, is similar to the Kumak project in that we're taking food insecurity um, a, a level deeper and um, in, in promoting these community gardens, there was a healing aspect to it. Um, not only were kids able to learn from science, but it promoted, um, promoted things through healing like you see in the image here. And IPS um, really helped to set up their market box program that included harvesting produce, um, securing home essentials, and even making deliveries early on in the pandemic. And then to follow that up with policy, how do we tie policy in with that? We also helped in facilitating discussions and plans for the Pomona School District to allow the use of their two and a half acre lot to be utilized by the whole community and not just students within the school district. So there are many great examples we can give regarding our work, but I'd um, like to mention our most recent project, our new Youth in Action project. And this project focuses on youth aged 12 to 26 that have been negatively influenced by the war on drugs. Um, what we know about the war on drugs is that it's led low income communities and communities of color to suffer high incarceration rates, family separation, and other unfavorable outcomes. And um, the war on drugs is just one prime example of how policies can produce ACEs for a large population of youth. And this emphasizes the need for us to be thoughtful when considering policies and the unintended consequences. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Andrea. Thank you, Carolina. Well, that is the end of um, the presentation portion for today's webinar. I do wanna give a big thank you to Erin and Carolina for providing such insightful presentation. Our presenters have shared a lot of information with us today. So if you are interested in connecting with them and asking them, um, questions yourselves, uh, you can go ahead and contact them. Their emails are on screen, so they're, they're emails, but it will also be shared um, via chat. Um, next slide, please. So we will be transitioning into the Q&A portion shortly, but before we do, I would like to, I did wanna ask you um, if you can take a minute or two to fill out our webinar evaluation. Um, if you take out your phones, you can scan the QR code on the screen that will take you directly to the evaluation um, for this webinar. Uh, we will also share the link uh, in the chat. So whichever is more convenient for you, um, you can do. And your feedback is valuable to us. Um, it just helps us improve our webinars uh, and go on from there. Um, so I did mention earlier, and I have seen some questions in the Q&A um, feature. We will be sharing the recording, so it is being recorded. And we will also, also share the slide deck. Um, and the slide deck, if you didn't notice, some um, portions were underlined. Those will, are hyperlinks. So all the um, sources will be accessible to you. So um, I also want to note that IPS offers trainings and technical assistance for all of um, our core competencies. So if you are interested in learning more about it, please reach out to us via email at info, info at publicstrategies.org. Okay, so now I will be jumping into the 
Q and A. I do see um, some questions have been posed for you, um, Carolina and Erin. So um, one question asks, well, Sue asks, I hope I'm pronouncing it right, Sue. Sorry if I chopped that off. Okay, so it says, sorry, sorry if I missed it, but does race and cultural culture play into how ACEs are perceived and the outcome? I can take that. Um, okay. Absolutely. So um, one of the things that we we forget that is that we're, we, although we are all different, we do have some shared cultural norms, right? So when we're talking about just race itself, let's look at what we've been experiencing within these last five years, whether it's uh, violence in the LBGTQ plus community or in the Asian community or in the African-American and Latinx community, right? Those things do play a huge factor in ACEs. There are, you know, when kids were being torn away from their parents and put into camps, that, that was very traumatic, you know, and, and we're still fighting to get those, those, those homes restored. When we're talking about the the um, like culture, right? Um, I know in 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 some of us in the black community, uh, spanking was allowed, and we may joke about it and say, "Oh, you know, I got the extension cord or or the the water hose or the belt." We joke about it, but that's abuse, right? And that is traumatic. And I see another question that. Um, I'm going to include in this where it says uh, is reversible. When I'm saying like what's not reversible is the event, the, the event occurred. And now all we can do is build the resiliency and try to reteach um, to rebuild those healthy relationships and, and bring back um, some, some healthy healing to the individual and their community. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, I think that did answer the question. So um, let's see, a lot are coming in. So I wanna make sure uh, I get to them. So it says, um, it sounds like you are doing a lot of great work around the uh, A screener. I am wondering what work you are doing to create systemic change. make sure that I'm unmuted here. I'll take this one. So um, uh, once again, this is kind of refers back to our policies of uh, where we want to address those conditions that really impact those that are most affected and looking at um, the war on drugs, our, our new project, um, the Youth in Action Project is working to make those systemic changes to make um, to make the quality of life better for youth that are experiencing those things. So we're, sometimes when we're, um, this, because this project is positioned um, near the border, we're also looking at things um, like immigrants, right? Some of these children, they're being separated from their families. Maybe they are, um, are um, citizens of the United States and, and maybe they aren't, but we're looking at um, developing those equitable policies and this is where our policy analysis comes in. So that one particular slide that Aaron was showing us um, where we can analyze our policies to determine if they're equitable, um, we can look at things to see it, um, is, do these people have access to legal representation? Um, is, are there language barriers? Um, is this policy culturally appropriate? So really, um, in making the shift into equitable policies, the first step is going to be anal um, analyzing policies. And then we can take that next step into working to create systems change. So I hope that answered your question. Thank you, Carolina. So the next question um, comes from Gina. She asks, uh, are the community gardens in the control of community members? Power and collective ownership increases engagement, builds community. So I'll take this one as well. Um, to answer this one, um, for these particular projects, like the Kumak project that I mentioned, um, there's a link to that particular project, and that is community driven. Um, while there is a, it is an organization that's providing it, 
they're they're grounded in their community and they have community volunteers um as and this is the same thing with the community garden project that we had in pomona this was um because the policy was facilitated to open it up not just to people in the school districts but to people within the community um all of these changes were based on community concerns and so therefore it was community driven thank you um okay so the next one um set will ask can you give us another example of local policy that we can push for to help prevent aces Brittany, you want to jump in on this one? <laughs> um, I'm trying to think if something comes to mind right away. Mm. I apologize. <laughs> I was not ready for this question. Um, Yeah, so I do see in the chat that um, people mentioned mentoring programs. Um, part of mentoring programs, what we, what we do is uh, we have youth advocacy groups or like youth coalitions that, um, that are involved in helping to create policy change. So they go through a process of learning how to be civically engaged and how to engage in, um, um, in creating community change in their neighborhood that's gonna affect them. Um, so I don't know if directly that answered your question, but that's one example of ways that we can influence policy um, through um, the efforts of our community residents that are young. Yeah, thank you, Carolina. And one thing that came to mind, and this doesn't necessarily help to prevent ACES, but maybe, you know, try to catch it early on is in one of our programs here in San Diego County, they're working with the local healthcare district to try to implement the ACEs screening um, in a new clinic that's being put in in the community. Um, so not necessarily preventing ACEs, but at least trying to catch it early on in a sense and trying to prevent continued um, ACEs occurring to the child. So that's one way and I apologize for <laughs> not being fully able to answer that question, but I hope it, it helps. Yeah, I wanna echo what Brittany says. I hope we answered that question, well, they answered that question correctly, but um, well, um, I, I guess those are some of the ways, um, well, some local policies at least. Um, so more questions are coming in. The next one um, asks, uh, is this program nationwide or only in California? Um, there are some nationwide uh, programs, like for example, PACES, what it does when it's talking about uh, connection, they offer uh, resources for mental health crisis support. If you go on their page, there are uh, several mental health crisis uh, support systems. And then it just goes to, let's say, general mental health support. Um, and then they also have resources um, for finding a therapist. They even have it to where you can do um, Black Mental Health Alliance, Black Virtual Therapist Network. Um, they, they, they provide uh, pride counseling um, because that's, that is another one that was mentioned when we were talking about the LBGTQ plus community that although say a child will express or begin to come into their own identity, they also may have to encounter um, uh, blowback from, from their, their immediate support system, like you know their parents and their family. So when you think about those type of counseling services, they can help not only bring awareness and education to the family that may be uh, resistant to that, but it can also bring uh, security and safety to that young individual that may that that is starting to come with uh, gender identity and um, sexual orientation identity. Uh, I hope that answers your question. So before we close, I just wanted to address a question that I did happen to see in the Q&A, but the, um, it disappeared. 
Um, so it was uh, regarding uh, the intersection of ACEs interventions and different um, subgroups like HIV, um, equity, and things like that. So um, just to expand a little bit further on the PACES connection is um, for this particular question, um, what we were looking at is uh, priority populations. So not only can you look at their resource page, uh, there is a link, one says geographic, which will take you to resources by geographic region, um, such as in your particular state. And then the next one is by interest groups. So you really get to take a look at all the different um, individual subgroups that are working to, um, to reduce ACEs um, in specific populations like foster youth, um, when we're looking at harm reduction things with substance abuse, and then um, also um, in, so in other priority populations. So there's a whole long list of um, of interest groups and part of that uh, collaborated collaboration process is to connect with those groups and find out what type of um, efforts they have that might be related to some of the things that you're asking. Thank you, Carolina. So I do see, um, I know we're coming to time, but I do want to address this one last thing. Um, Carol asked if we can provide a list of resources in writing regarding ACEs, like research information, et cetera. Um, yeah, I can do that. I can put something together. Yes, we can, yes. And I'm, I will be, like we mentioned, um, all these slides are gonna be sent out to you, the recording as well. So these slides um, are hyperlinked to all the resources um, our presenters have shared today. Um, so that is all the time we have. Um, thank you again, once again, Carol Carolina and Aram for providing such a great presentation, so eye-opening. Um, and a, a big thank you, especially to uh, everyone who attended. Uh, we do hope to see you next time and we'll, we'll see you till then. Thank you. Thank you. Bye everyone. Thank you all.